Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. 7. He examines the data. Fact. Doyle 10 had a sister, Jessica 6. Fact. His interrogation of the little girl, Mary Mary 2, has revealed that Logan is with Jessica. He watches the board. It is silent. Dark. No lights glow. No needles quiver. The maze scanners are silent. Dark. The gun tracer is silent. Dark. The follower is silent. Dark. Impossible. His quarry has vanished. Late night. Hell. Named after the ancient religious concept of eternal punishment. Over a thousand miles of dead glare ice wilderness between Baffin Bay and the Bering Sea. A sharded tumble of flows and bergs and nightmare crevasses of daggered ice cliffs and howling glacial frost winds. A crippling, killing, freezing, forsaken world of white on white on white. Hell. Fourteen burrows in an irregular semicircle on the lee side of a storm card berg. Each cramped ice cell clawed from iron by sur from the iron surface by dying, lonely men and women working in sub-zero cold. Near the entrance to one hide hole was a rich red stain on the ice glass, where an unknown convict had lung hemorrhaged under the refrigerated glare of the midnight sun. The maelstorm of cold had shaped the ledge into a stubby pedestal, and topping the pedestal was a hand hewn ice block. Within the transparent mass, a dark shape swam in frozen silence. There were no guards, nor were they ever needed. No man ever walked out of hell. When Logan and Jess arrived, an alarm sounded. The platform itself dealt with them. They were needle-stunned, packaged and conveyed through a force field labyrinth, and dumped on the ice. The platform had disappeared. There was no way back. Warden came to meet them. A man hunched against driving wind, a fur-shrouded scarecrow. His feet were rag-wrapped, his face old, leather and iodine. His eyes burned under a filth-stiffened parka. He bent over their cocoon figures and his mittened hand clumsily stripped away the con webbing. Waddling the precious material, he thrust it into his parka. Cold clubbed them. Logan stumbled up, pulling Jess with him. In the severe cold, the effects of the needle drug were rapidly dissipated. Where, where's the key? he asked Warden. This man must be their contact. When you come to hell, they throw away the keys. Logan felt the brass taste of fear in his mouth. They were in the escape-proof prison city at the North Pole. Come, learn the rules, said Warden. He turned his back and paced off against the glare sheet. They struggled after him. The wind died to a low snarl as they reached the partial shelter of the great iceberg, which loomed over the burrows. Your neighbors, said the Warden. Furs waddled figures surrounded them. Emerging in clots of two and three from the ink-mouthed holes, Logan scanned the emaciated, skull-haunted faces that hedged him in a wolf circle. Rule 1, said Borden. A new convict can pick his antagonist. 2. The antagonist can use any weapon he has to defend himself and his goods. 3. The new man fights barehanded. That's all the rules we got, except winner gets first cut. And if I don't fight, asked Logan, then you die on the ice, said Worden. Of course, that don't go for the girl, he grinned. And you better get to it. Couple minutes more out here, just like you are, and you won't need to choose. Under the wind's hammer... Logan's clothing was gauze. He measured the corded figures, looking for weakness and found none. These were survivors. No soft ones here. He pointed a random finger. Him, said Logan. The circle tightened to take up the slack left by the man who stepped forward. Tall, long-armed, thick-shouldered. From the matted fur at his chest, he drew forth a needle-pointed stiletto of hand-burnished ice. Eight inches of lethal blade, shaped with an artist's care. Instantly, he lunged. The stiletto flashed. He had led with the knife. Logan took advantage of the mistake to chop the weapon from his hand. It shattered on the ice, but Logan's foot slid on one of the shards and he was down, the man atop him, hands at his throat. Logan felt the sinewed fingers close on his windpipe. He broke the chokehold in the man's neck with one blow. Warden looked stunned and disappointed. The circle of eyes shifted hungrily to the bed dead body, already frost-dusted. Now they moved in to strip the clothing, which they piled at Logan's feet. The corpse was hustled away. That was Harry Seven you just took care of, said Warden. Pick up his clothes and claim his goods. Warden walked to the mouth of a burrow. This hide hole's yours. Harry didn't have no woman. You share everything with the girl. Logan followed Jess into the narrow, fetid mouth of the ice cave. 
Inside, they hurriedly donned the evil-smelling hides of Harry Seven. The temperature was 20 degrees warmer, but it was still chillingly cold. They sat down together on a thin layer of ice, shredded con webbing. Shredded, a thin layer of shredded con webbing, which had been spread against the ice. Logan pressed close to Jess. She withdrew, her face set. Well, here we go again, he thought angrily. She knew he'd had no choice out there. She was alive in the clothes of a dead man, but she couldn't accept the fact that he had to kill to get them. I listened to you as we were coming into the platform, he said. I hid the gun so the contact wouldn't connect me with DS. With the gun, we'd have some kind of a chance here, but we don't. And right now, you need me a lot more than I need you. After a moment, he felt her settle against him. What are we going to do, she asked. Nothing, until we know more. A scuffing sound at the entrance. Warden appeared. Come see Black Tom. They followed him out. Warden led them for a short distance across the blowing ice. Here he is, Warden gestured theatrically. He looked up at the dark shape in the transparent block above them. Inside the ice was part of a man. He had no legs. One of his arms was a flat paddle-shaped stump. The remaining arm arched forward, terminating in taloned fingers. All the fat was gone, and the bone structure was exposed in raw relief. The arm strained in a bowed curve, clawing for knife. life. Nestled against the shoulder was the head. Staring out of a twisted vidges were eyes of milk. Wind and sun and wilderness had carved him. He was black. He was a white man once, said Warden. Jessica looked away. Black Tom's up there for a reason, Warden went on. He ain't what you'd call decoration. You can learn from Tom. He cracked the two-year mark in hell. He watched him come and watched him go until he went snowblind at the end of the first year. A month later, Frostbite got his legs, but that didn't slow him. He dug two burrows by himself to keep his place, and tanned the skins you're wearing on your backs. They say he bit his arm off when an ice slide trapped him. Anyhow, he come in without it. Tom lived longest because he learned fastest, Warden spat on the ice. Me, I've lasted more in a year already, and there's none here can say the same. Do like you're told and you may last the week. Savage, flamed Jess. Why do you live like this? Warden's reply was edged. Living's better than dying. You could cooperate, she said. You could work together instead of slaughtering each other. Work for what? Food, clothing, tools. There's damn little food, less clothing, and no tools. It takes wood and stone and metal to build something, and the only metal around here is in box. A man loped up to drop a soggy bundle at their feet. Here's your cut, the man said to Logan. He picked up the bundle and unwrapped the liver and heart of Harry Seven. Jess stepped back with a look of horror. Logan dropped the bundle. It stained the snow. We don't waste food here, snapped Warden. This ain't a three-mile complex in Nebraska. Now pick up your share. When you get hungry enough, you'll eat it. And that's where we're going to stop that chapter for now. Ah. <sighs>